So let us begin this worship service with these words that us stand for our call to worship. From Psalm 22, verses 27 and 28, God calls us to worship with these words. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over all the nations. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, on this a season of our rejoicing because of the resurrection of the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, may we all together praise you and worship you and give you thanks for your wonderful love, for the love that you have for your people that you gave your only begotten Son uh, to die for all the sins of your people. And so now, as we remember, let us commemorate uh, His love for us and His sufferings for us during this worship service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us remain standing and sing uh, our opening hymn, There is a fountain filled with blood. <clears throat> and his other enemies. 
even by his own son Absalom, who usurped his throne. In this psalm, David laments, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was so weary of the scorn, rejection, mockery, and even the threat of death. Therefore, David's lament is real and not to be taken as merely a prophecy about Jesus' last three hours on the cross. Nevertheless, Psalm 22 is a prophetic psalm about the sufferings of the Messiah, the Christ. So we find in this psalm several things that happened to our Lord while He hung on the cross. In verse 18 of Psalm 22, is a prophecy about the Roman soldiers dividing his garments by lot. In verse 7, the people watching the crucifixion wag their heads in mockery of Jesus. In verse 8, his enemies challenge God, even challenge God to rescue him. And then in one of the most familiar prophecies in Psalm 22, we see David's words of lament and cried out loudly by Christ in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So in this first meditation, we will see three things. First, Jesus called on his Father in death. So notice that even in his unrelenting pain and imminent death, Jesus called on his Father in heaven, calling him, My God, my God. The words he used is, Eli, Eli. And since Eli it sounds similar to the name Eliyahu or Elijah, the people thought that he was calling for Elijah the prophet. But he was calling for his God, his Heavenly Father. Jesus is our preeminent example when we face sufferings and even death. We are to call for God for help, uh, or God for help, refuge and strength. We are not all on prophets, apostles, or any other saints for help in our time of need. And so David in verse 19 pleads with assurance, O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Although David feels that God has forsaken him, he still prays in Psalm 27 verse 9, Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. He remembers God's promise to Joshua long ago, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is the God of his salvation. And then in verse 22, after God delivers him, he will praise God in the assembly of the saints. Because in verses 23 and 29, he praises God because he remembers God's good provisions and help to his suffering people. In Psalm 37, verse 28, David puts his trust in the Lord. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But in the, in the following line, he also says, But the children of the wicked shall be cut off. Isaiah echoes also this judgment. In Isaiah 128, But rebels and sinners shall be broken together. And those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. The Lord will never forsake His people, but He will forsake, cut off, <coughs> break, and consume those who are not His people. Unrepentant believers may not suffer and even prosper in this life, but on judgment day, God will forsake them. And forsake is what God the Father did to His Son on the cross. And so second, but His Father forsook Him. Jesus called His Father to help Him in His sufferings on the cross, but His Father forsook Him. How can God forsake His perfectly obedient, righteous, and holy Son? Does this mean that He ceased from, being, from loving our Lord? This also begs the question, if God forsook His Son on the cross, then did the Christ cease being the Son of God and separated from the Father? No, the, the Son of God cannot ever be separated from the Father. 
and for that matter from the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is the Trinity forever. There is no moment in forever or in time that the Trinity is not the Trinity. But when Jesus cried out, My God, why have you forsaken me? He, he was being placed under his Father's eternal wrath during those six hours on the cross. But how can a, uh, a person suffer God's eternal wrath without being separated from Him? We must remember that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Even those in hell cannot hide from His presence. Jesus' experience of God's wrath is unique. He, the eternal Son of God, was not in any way separated from God or ceased from being the Son of God in those hours. But He suffered hell for all the sins of all His people. And this reminds us of the statement in the Apostles' Creed. He was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. We must never think that Jesus' soul went down to hell to preach to the unbelieving souls there. No, he never did. What the descent means is that Jesus figuratively, figuratively descended into hell by suffering all what the Heidelberg Catechist in question and answer 44 says, suffering all the inexpressible anguish, pains, and terrors on the cross, and even before in his life. But question and answer 44 also adds that by his sufferings, he has redeemed me, he has redeemed you from the anguish and torment of hell. Christ did not literally go down to hell. He suffered the equivalent of all the elect spending eternity in hell. And this leads us to our third point. The Father forsook Him, so the Father will embrace us. Heidelberg Catechist in question and answer 37, also in the Belgian Confession, Article 21, affirms, Christ sustained in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. And this affirmations answer two important questions. How would one act of righteousness by one man, Christ, satisfy God's eternal wrath against countless unrepentant sinners? How would his sacrifice on the cross for a few hours satisfy God's eternal adjustment of eternal hell for them? The answer to these two questions is grounded on Jesus being the Son of God, both fully human and fully divine. Even when He was forsaken by God on the cross and on the tomb, who can sustain God's eternal wrath except the only man who is the eternal Son of God? And who can sacrifice His own body and blood for all the sins of all His people except the only man who was perfectly sinless and obedient to his Father's commandments. Friends, this Good Friday, we remember Christ's sufferings and death on the cross, forsaken by God and placed under God's eternal wrath. All of these he really did in order that his Father will embrace us, his beloved people. Let us therefore sing praises to him, when I proclaim my praise to you, then all the church will hear. Amen. Let us now stand and sing our second hymn, My God, my God, why have you, oh why have you forsaken me? This is from Psalm 22 also.
The second lesson is uh, I will read a few scriptures uh, from Psalm, uh, from Matthew, and from John. So from Psalm 69, uh, verses uh, 20, actually. <clears throat> Verse 20 only, uh, 21 only. The word of the Lord, they gave me portion for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. And then from Matthew 27, uh, 34 and 48. The word of the Lord. They offered him wine to drink, mixed with gold, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And then from verse 48, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And one of them at once uh, took sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And then from John 19, verses 28 and 29. The word of the Lord. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop <coughs> branch and held it to his mouth. That's part of the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. <coughs> One of the many questions about Jesus' death is about the two cups that he was offered when he was thirsty. In his account of Jesus' crucifixion, Matthew says that Jesus was offered wine mixed with gold, a bitter drink. This part of Jesus' crucifixion is confusing to many Christians, enough to cause some to say that the four Gospels have conflicting narratives. So to harmonize these narratives, we have to account for two instances, not one, when Jesus was offered to drink. So Matthew and Mark mention both instances, while Luke and John tell only of the second instance. How do we know this? In Matthew 27, 33 to 35, Jesus was offered to drink after he arrives in Golgotha, but before, before he was nailed to the cross. So note that after he was offered this drink, verse 35 says, and when they had crucified him. So Mark has a very similar account. Later, both Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus was offered to drink again while he hung on the cross. But there are also differences between these two occasions of drink offerings to Jesus. The first difference is that wine mixed with gold was offered the first time and sour wine was offered the second time. So the second difference is that Jesus refused to drink the first offering of wine mixed with gold, but asked for and accepted the second drink offering of sour wine by saying, I thirst. So first, the cup he refused. Before he was crucified, after arriving at Golgotha, he was offered wine mixed with gold in Matthew, or in Mark, it's mixed with myrrh. And myrrh and gold are bitter substances. Gold was used to refer to narcotics and even poisons because of its bitter taste, while myrrh was used as a perfume, a flavoring, uh, used for embalming the dead, and also as a narcotic. So what this means is that myrrh was mixed into the wine in a substantial amount 
so that the wine became as bitter as gall. Jesus was offered this drink repeatedly, repeatedly, but was steadfast in his refusal to take it. So why did he strongly reject to drink it? The night before, our Lord spent hours praying in the Garden of Eden, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The bitter drink that was offered to him is a picture of the bitter cup that he was about to drink to accomplish his Father's will for him. But that bitter drug cup offered before Jesus was crucified would have prevented him from accomplishing the redemption that he set out to do from eternity. <clears throat> Why? Because if he was not completely aware of his suffering, if he was not feeling and experiencing his forsakenness by his father, if he was in this state because of the narcotic drink, his mission would have been a failure. And so for six hours, he suffered hell physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And then the second drink that was offered to him is a cup that he accepted. So near the end of his life on the cross, all four Gospels agree that sour wine was offered to Jesus. It is during this instance that Jesus uttered the words, I thirst, prompting those who heard him to offer him sour wine for drink. So this sour wine is cheap wine mixed with water that the soldiers were drinking, in contrast to the wine offered several hours before. So in saying, I thirst, Jesus was fulfilling Psalm 69, 21, which says, They gave me poison or gall for food, and for my taste, a thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. So this second cup is the cup overflowing with God's wrath against the sins of his people. This is the same terrible cup that Jesus prayed that the Father would take away from his hand. But even so, he willingly drank it. It is much more bitter than the wine mixed with gall. Jesus knew what this cup means from Psalm 75, 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. So the wicked are the ones who will drink God's cup of wrath in hell. And this will be fulfilled on Judgment Day, when in Revelation 14 and 16, we read, They will drink of the wine of God's wrath, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur forever and ever. But for the sake of those who repent of their sins, Jesus had to drink this bitter cup as well. As well. Jesus refused to drink the first cup of bitterness because if he drank it, he will not be able to drink the second cup, the cup of God's eternal wrath against our sins. And so this, those are the two cups that he drank, I mean the tea he had on the cross. And finally, the third cup. The third cup is for us. All his life, Jesus was resolute in his mission to drink this bitter cup of God's wrath against the sins of his people. He referred to his sufferings and death as drinking my cup. In the upper room on the night he was betrayed, he would offer them to drink his cup, his blood shed on the cross for their sins. He says, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But the Lord promised us a coming day of restoration, judgment day. 
He will take the cup of wrath from his sinful people and pour it out instead on their enemies. Behold, he says in Isaiah 51, Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more, and I will put it into the hand of your tormentors. This is what Jesus had done on the cross. When God condemned us because of our rebellion, we deserved to drink to the dregs of the cup of God's wrath. Instead, Jesus took this cup away from us and he really drank it on our behalf. So God poured out his wrath on him because of our sins. In this way, Jesus replaced our cup of wrath with a cup of salvation, his salvation. And instead of God feeding us bitter poison as our death sentence, Christ is nourishing and feeding us and communing with us with his body broken and shed blood for us on the cross. In Psalm 69, 24, David prayed against his enemies. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. But Jesus, while God was pouring out his cup of wrath on him on the cross, prayed for his enemies and for you. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. With the psalmist, we must then exclaim in thankfulness to God. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. This cup given by our Savior is overflowing with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And as we partake God's goodness and mercy all our lives, let us declare in thankfulness, the Lord is my chosen cup, a chosen portion, and my cup. And my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Christ suffered extreme thirst and the bitter cup of God's wrath in order that he may offer us the cup of salvation filled with water unto eternal life that will satisfy our thirst forever. May we, God's people, be found hungry and thirsty for Christ and His perfect righteousness all the way to His bitter death on the cross.
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Afternoon. Good evening. Either way. <laughs> One privilege of being asked to do this with uh, our kissing cousins in the Reformed faith <laughs> is that we embody what it looks like to have true Christian unity. Amen. Not unity at the expense of truth and not truth at the expense of unity. That's my preparatory statement of thanksgiving to be here. And so the passage that we will look at here in the third lesson you see is Isaiah 53 verse 5 and then the first portion of John 19 verse 30. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. In the first portion of John chapter 19 verse 30 says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is is finished. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Much can be lost in translation. Would you agree? From language to language, from culture to culture, much can be missed in translating particular words and phrases. Often words which appear to us as mere ink on a page Make a poor medium for communicating the emotion, the feeling, and the zeal with which they were intended. These words of Jesus can all too easily be read as words of despair or resignation or the final gasp of pure exhaustion. Uh, when you, and I know that we're not going to pretend like everyone in this room is as young as I am. <laughs> if you don't split and stack your own wood anymore, you remember what it felt like anyway, don't you? Right. Okay. Do you remember splitting and stacking the last round and getting it in the woodshed and the, and the sense of accomplishment that you had? These words of Jesus, though often misunderstood, communicate to us the great sense of accomplishment of his task on the cross. These words are the hinge upon which the whole drama of the cross turns from humiliation and defeat and death to glory, victory, and life. These are the words of our Savior, Savior's jubilant triumph. These three English words, it is finished, are actually just one word in Greek. You didn't know you were going to become a Greek scholar tonight, did you? This is most first-year students' uh, favorite Greek word. And it still remains my favorite Greek word. Tetelestai. Tetelestai. This word carries the idea of completeness, fullness and maturity. It's the only fitting word to describe the completion of Christ's earthly task laid on him by the counsel of the Godhead from before the foundation of the world. The full scope of God's redemptive work now comes to its fulfillment in one word. Can you imagine? The work of God beginning in the garden with the shed blood of that first sacrificial animal by the hand of God himself to clothe Adam and Eve's nakedness. The gracious provision of the ram caught in the thicket as Abraham held the dagger above his son Isaac's body. The millions of gallons of blood poured over the altar under the Levitical codes of sacrifice. 
the blood of bulls and goats and lambs and birds for the mediation and the forgiveness of sin. All the way to the prophetic cries of the prophets pointing toward the suffering servant who would be pierced for our transgressions and wounded for our iniquities, all coming to a head on the cross of Calvary, is finally perfected and fulfilled in one word. But we can say it in English. Say it with me. It is finished. In this moment, having preached the good news, having made the good confession, having shown the goodness of God even to those around him who previously had been mocking and scorning him, Jesus takes great satisfaction in his accomplished task. While he lived, Jesus said that his food was to do the will of the Father. And as Jesus cries out, it is finished, we ought to hear the contented exclamation of a man who has eaten every morsel of God's law, pushed his plate back from the table, and reclined in full satisfaction from his feast of obedience. In creation, six days of work gave way to the seventh day of divine rest. But that rest was not a mere ceasing from activity. Instead, the Sabbath rest of God was the reflection of God on all that he had accomplished, all that he had wrought by his power, all that was perfected by his manifold wisdom and grace. And by exclaiming, it is finished, Jesus was exclaiming, an equivalent phrase from that in creation where God exclaimed, it is good. But not just it is good. He adds a word at the end of all of it. It is very good. All that Jesus has done on the cross is very good. This was the first rest Jesus had experienced in his entire earthly life. From the moment he took on flesh in the blessed body of the Virgin, he had lived under the weight of frail and fallen humanity. And during Christ's life, he endured constant temptation, harassment, and assault from the father of lies, the great accuser of God's people, Satan himself. From the moment Christ entered this world as a baby, to this exact moment on the cross, he had not one moment of true and genuine rest. He had glimpses and moments. But now, Jesus cries, it is finished. His work and his labor is done. The most frightful moment of Satan's existence was not when he was cast from God's throne room or when he attacked on Job, the godly servant, or even when Christ had resisted him to his temptations in the wilderness, the most frightful moment of Satan's existence occurred the moment this word was uttered from the mouth of Jesus Christ. As that word, to Tetelestai, thundered against the walls of hell, Satan shuddered because he knew he had utterly failed in every attempt. All the hopes and plans of Satan, our great enemy, were dashed in a moment. And the hopes of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness were fulfilled. The foul beast of the deep did not know the deeper magic that when the willing Redeemer, the Son of God and Son of Man, died in his people's stead, the cross would be emptied of its power over him, and death itself would be peeled backward. In finishing the work of redemption, Jesus Christ, the second Adam, has removed the flaming sword from the entrance to the garden and opened the gates of fellowship with God once again so that you and I can walk and talk with him in the cool of his creation as we were intended to do. 
The last word is yet to come, but the last word of our third lesson is to remember this. All the work needed to accomplish your salvation, your forgiveness, your redemption, your adoption as sons and daughters of God, and to receive the inheritance of eternal life is not in anything you or I could ever do, but it is in the work of Jesus Christ alone. Which is why for our sake, for our benefit, he cries, it is finished. Now, I have included a small prayer, and I would ask that you would join me before we continue to sing and worship. O Lord Jesus Christ, who finished the work that you were sent to do, enable us by your Holy Spirit to be faithful to our call. Grant us strength to bear our crosses and endure our sufferings even unto death. And enable us to live and love faithfully. That we also become good news to the world. Joining your witness, proclaiming in your finished work. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, you have your hymnal. We're going to sing Man of Sorrows, What a Name, hymn 352. taken from Psalm 31 verse 5 and then Luke 23 verse 46 into your hand I commit my spirit you have redeemed me O Lord faithful God the gospel of Luke chapter 23 verse 46 then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said father into your hands I commit my spirit and having said this, he breathed his last. This is the last of Christ's seven sayings or words from the cross, all of which are either quotations from various places in the Old Testament scripture or spoken of fulfillment in prophecy. Here Jesus harkens back to Psalm 31, which is a Psalm of David. Of course, I read the, the very end, but I think it's good for context to read the first few verses before that. And so Psalm 31, verses 1 through 4, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your namesake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. It's good to remember that Christ, the incarnate Word of God, died with the Word of God on his lips. 
This psalm makes it clear that just as Christ's cry, it is finished, was not a cry of defeat or surrender, so too was Christ's commendation of his spirit into the care of his heavenly Father as a joyful, confident, and contented act. It was a testament to the fact that God the Father had accepted Christ's sacrifice. We heard from Pastor Nolly that the relationship, the fellowship between Christ and the other persons of the Trinity, Father and Spirit, was never broken and can never be broken. And so Jesus, in perfect fellowship with God the Father, offering these as his final words are a reassurance to us that God the Father said yes and amen to everything that Christ had done from the moment of his incarnation to this very moment of his expiration. This psalm, Psalm 31, speaks five times of God as refuge or fortress and four times of God's deliverance and rescue. In just a few short verses, we are given a picture of God as an impenetrable fortress of rescue for His people. In all of these images, we see God's presence as the only safe haven for one's soul. Though this psalm, excuse me, through this psalm, Jesus was declaring His absolute confidence that God the Father approved of and received His work throughout His life, but in particular, His work on the cross as the perfect payment and satisfaction for the sin of His people. It also seems clear from the Gospels that Jesus did not see the cross as an obstacle to obedience to God's will, nor did He see it as a terrible suffering to be avoided. Now, He did say, if it is possible, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But of course, we know that Jesus says ultimately what? Not my will, but yours be done. So if it is the Father's will, and ultimately we know that it's actually the will of the Godhead from eternity past, that many people have a misconception that that it's the, the will of the Father, and therefore Jesus has to say, okay, Dad, I guess I will. It's completely inaccurate. Because we know that it's actually the counsel of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from before the foundation of the world that determined that Christ would be the suffering servant and Savior. And so Jesus instead sees his work on the cross not as a path to to be avoided, but as the path to take to commit his soul into the hands of His heavenly Father. Though, as A.W. Pink says in his commentary on these final words of Christ from the cross, he said, The light of God's holy countenance was hidden from Christ the sin-bearer for a brief time. Jesus, being fully aware and fully engulfed in the fellowship with the Father, committed His Spirit unto His care. What does it mean to commit his spirit in this sense? The word used here indicates that in committing his spirit unto the Father, Christ was depositing, placing in care or trust, or entrusting his soul to the Heavenly Father. Of course, this is what Jesus had done all throughout his earthly life, and especially during the trial of his arrest and subsequent sufferings. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 23 and 24 tells us this, that when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. See, those are things that you and I might do. That's not what Christ did. But instead, we are told, he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus entrusted himself to the Father because Jesus was assured of the Father's love, mercy, and holiness. And because of this, Jesus' trust in the Father was wholehearted and genuine. This was the condition upon which Jesus' self-offering was made. Jesus' confidence in the goodness, grace, 
And a righteousness of the Father was foundational. It was the animus offerentis. Now you know Greek and Latin. Meaning it's the goodwill of the offerer in trusting the one in whom they are handing over the keys to. Jesus demonstrated this in many parables. When he talked about the, the faithful servants as opposed to the wicked servants, they were the ones that, that actually took the goodwill of the master in mind in how they were accountable for what they had been given. It's what we will see when we continue to read, not just on Sunday, but following about the, the interaction between Jesus and the apostles, that though they had failed in every respect, through Jesus' forgiveness and reinstatement of them, we see him, what, handing over the keys, so to speak, to the good news of the preaching of the gospel to them. Ultimately, this is because Jesus entrusts himself, and therefore he entrusts his gospel, and therefore he entrusts salvation itself into the good, gracious, and sovereign hands of our Heavenly Father. You see, this serves as the antidote to all the false gods in which we trust at various times through our sinful failure. How easy it is for us to look to fallen things, or even to good yet not ultimate things, to bring us comfort, consolation, and to captivate our attention. Yet it is to God alone that we must entrust our souls. This is the great contrast that Jesus willingly entrusted his body to the hatred, violence, and wickedness of his tormentors, which accomplished the design and the purpose of God, yet he entrusted his soul to God, his heavenly Father, which accomplished the design and the purpose of God perfectly. What a joy for Christ and for us to know that never again will he suffer at the hands of wicked men. Never again will he suffer in any way, for any reason, but only that he will bring the victory, because he has entrusted his soul to the Heavenly Father, and by extension, what do we do when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? We say, here I am, here I am, Lord, much like the prophet Isaiah in his vision. His heavenly vision of the exalted God in his throne room, Confronted with God's holiness and light of his sinfulness, he says, Woe is me, but as God's forgiveness and purifying work comes to him, what does he say? Here I am. The seal of John Calvin is, Here is my heart, Lord. I offer it sincerely and promptly. That's good advice for you and me tonight. That we would offer ourselves to the Lord every day, sincerely, and promptly, that we would not hesitate, but we would give him all we are and trust in him completely. There's so much more to say, but I'll end with a brief story. You know that on the night of the Passover, the very first Passover, when Israel still was held in captivity in Egypt, and God had promised deliverance, and, and after many plagues, finally, God had promised a final plague that would break the back and the will of the hard-hearted Pharaoh. And God said, I will send death upon the firstborn of this land. But for you to be safe, you must take a lamb, pure and spotless. For you and all in your household, you must kill that lamb. You must spread its blood over your doorpost. And you must keep watch as the angel of death passes by. And you know the story. And of course, you know the story about the two Jewish neighbors, right? Bob and Jim. And Bob and Jim, after they place the blood over their doorposts, stand outside looking at their work and like you do with your neighbors when you mow your lawns at the exact same time you look over the fence and say oh, that, that looks pretty good you say yeah yeah you too and so bob said to jim you know that looks great but i gotta ask you brother are you nervous at all are you are you worried 
about tonight? And Jim said, worried about what? We placed the blood. God gave us his promise. We've done all we can do. I, what are we worried about? Bob says, well, I, I know, but I mean, an angel, death, and, and it's going to pass through right in front of our house. I mean, tell me you're not just a little bit concerned and worried. Jim says, what do I have to worry about? God has promised. Let the angel do his worst. They go to bed that night. Let me ask you, which one of those men woke up in the morning with a dead son? And of course the answer is neither. Because the work that God had promised, the salvation, the deliverance that God had promised on the blood was not dependent upon the amount of confidence or the work or the earnestness of the person in the house. Rather, it was dependent upon His promise and His word and what He would do. And salvation in a nutshell is you and I simply saying, I believe that God will do what He has promised to do. And you and I have the benefit, not necessarily of looking forward, but looking backward at what Christ has already done and saying, I believe that what Jesus did, past and perfect tense, on the cross, is the blood that covers me and my sins. No work on my part. I don't have to have more faith than you, and you don't have to have more faith than me. We simply have to trust and commit ourselves into the hands of a gracious and sovereign God. Because that's what our Lord Jesus did. He committed his soul into the hand of his heavenly Father. And that's the key to true peace. Being covered by the blood of the Lamb, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, given to you and me through simple faith, Believing that Jesus has indeed paid it all. We're not charismatics, we're not Pentecostals, but that's a good spot for an amen, right? Amen. Yeah. Let's continue to worship the Lord as we turn to Him. 336, O sacred head now wounded. Sunday. And that's why we can call this day good. 
And, and so I would encourage you, uh, be here Sunday morning. Be at Grace if you're with us. Uh, uh, if you know friends and family and neighbors, invite them here. Invite them with us wherever you fellowship uh, so that they can hear the gospel clearly presented so that ideally, in God's timing and God's way, we would know that we will share eternity with them. Let me pray and then send us out. Father, into whose hands your Son, Jesus Christ, commended his Spirit, grant that we too, following his example, may in all of life and at the moment of our death, entrust our lives into your faithful hands of love. The hands outstretched upon the cross are the hands that receive us into your kingdom. We thank you and we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but Jesus, as we reflect upon your death specifically this evening, we thank you that you gave all, that you gave your very life, that you might have us for your own, and yours we are. In your name we pray. Amen. The benediction this evening from 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 through 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.